So our conference theme for this year is religion from the inside. For some, this is an oxymoron. Religion is, as in the Ghazarian tradition, a matter of tasting, dhouk. On this view, the outsider can no more describe faith than a man can describe the taste of a dish which he has never tasted. In Tübingen, Josef van Es, despite his acknowledged position as the greatest interpreter of medieval Muslim theology, was able to insist that Muslims themselves possess the best understanding of the meaning of Muslim worship. As an outsider, he believed himself disadvantaged. But for others, insider spaces are caught in strong, poorly understood currents and tides of personal need and loyalty, and hence can never provide a vantage point from which one can dispassionately observe, quantify, and conclude. In a way, this argument is the crux of Enlightenment Project, so that departments of theology and religious studies agonistically straddle the two worlds of the primitive and the rational, the subjective and the scientific, the tribal and the individual. In this zero-sum game, academe is seen as the theater in which faith fights a slow, retreating battle against a rival armed with more modern equipment. The outcome of this drama was always said to be obvious. And yet, this battlefield remains active. After at least two centuries of determined assaults, ambushes, and inventive new strategies on each side, the field of honor has also been the site of internal strife, as neither secular modernity nor spiritual, scriptural faith have found it possible to field a unified army. Anthropologists, philosophers, text critics, linguistic theorists, and others cannot agree, but neither can the theologians or the religiously sensitive students of the holy. Perhaps this is unsurprising, given the quite recent collapse of so many other progressist binaries. Modernity gives us blessings, but also challenges us with black swan threats such as climate change, artificial intelligence, genetics, and much else. Triumphalism of any kind has become difficult. A secularity or a religion that looks forward to a rational heaven on earth has been quite comprehensively chastened. As someone who daily inhabits this arena, and in fact has located within it a peaceable, but hopefully alert habitat, I propose today to describe a specific instance of this dialectic. I'm someone who first learned Islam in a madrasa in the Balkans, and then at the Imam Hatib and Ilahiyat theology schools of secular Turkey, but I also studied at the Pontifical Universities of Gregorian, as well as Theologicum, oh, sorry, um, um, Angelicum in Rome, and at Cambridge's Faculty of Divinity. I can claim to have visited and indeed somehow inhabited all these separate worlds. And in my present habitus in a German secular university, cradle of the 19th century Tübingen School of Skeptical Scriptural Studies, but also of numerous philosophers of religion deeply invested in the projects of modernity, I am privileged to participate in the creation of a department of Islamic theology whose symbolic struggles may well illustrate, if not always illuminate, the insider-outsider binary whose real or imagined existence is the focus of our deliberations at this conference. It was in 2011 that the University of Tübingen took the decision to establish a center for Islamic theology a new academic unit dedicated to the study of Islam, intended to be equivalent to its two existing faculties of Protestant and Catholic theology. This was based on the 2010 recommendation of the German Council of Science and Humanities, Wissenschaftsrat, followed by the federal government's approval. On the basis of this initiative, departments or institutes of Islamic theology were created not only in Tübingen, but in Osnabrück, Münster, Frankfurt, Gießen, Erlangen, Paderborn, and now the Humboldt University of Berlin. From the government and provincial perspective, the published intention was to ensure parity between the use of taxpayers' funds in support of training institutions for the country's major religions, the older Catholic and Protestant faculties reflecting Germany's religious experience with the addition of Islamic theology a response to the new demographic reality of a diversifying German society. From the point of view of Muslim communities, 
the new institutions have been welcomed, not only as a symbol of acceptance, but also as an opportunity to intensify the quality and quantity of Muslim leadership in the German context. In the specific case of the Tübingen Initiative, and to varying degrees, in the case of the other institutions also, three guiding principles have defined this endeavor of rooting Islamic theology in German academe. One, balance between theory and practice. Two, dialogue between traditional Islamic disciplines and social sciences, as well as oriental studies. And three, serious engagement with the interfaith context. Here, I would like to briefly reflect on these three principles. What is meant by a balance between theory and practice is that not only do we train theologians, but also teachers of Islam for German public schools, as well as future staff for the spiritual care sector. Theology, of course, is that academic discipline which, while remaining alert to the larger intellectual trends of the contemporary academy, seeks to provide outcomes for the lived pastoral reality of faith communities, as well as developing philosophical tools to allow it to make sense of a rapidly changing world. German universities have maintained a historic tradition of embedding theology deeply within state universities, with a view to providing thinkers and also faith leaders who can practically impact their parish communities. This has roots deep in local history, in an often troubled past when relations between communities were strained and the need for direct and meaningful ethical guidance from church leaders was acute. With a range of study programs at both undergraduate, BA and postgraduate, MA and PhD level, our Center for Islamic Theology, while supporting around 200 students and with specialists working in various important areas of Islamic theology, including scripture, law, systematic theology, mysticism and history, seeks to maintain this concern for public impact and utility. Many of our graduates work in public sector roles, particularly in education and spiritual care, and are in a unique position to shape and guide younger members of Muslim communities as they seek to define their relationship with wider German society. We are, in that sense, eminently and centrally pastoral. Germany's growing Muslim population, in many respects, maintains a set of responses to modernity rooted in countries of origin. Hence, in the case of Turkish communities, for instance, the variegated responses to Turkey's Republican experiment, which provide religious markers for quite segregated populations, are largely present in the Federal Republic. Hence, there are German Dianet representatives, Sufi orders, Suleymanji pietists, Gulenists, modernists, Ottoman nostalgics, and Alevis rooted in Anatolian folk Shiism, alongside other Muslim communities stemming from the Balkans, North Africa, and Middle East. To this mix is added the complex set of demands and promises offered by membership of a German culture, which is complexly Christian and secular. The theological enterprise to be pursued in the new academic hubs must, therefore, be open to exploring Islamic civilization's strong, but sometimes contested normative responses to the challenges of minority existence, to internal Muslim heterogeneity, and also to the myriad intellectual and moral challenges posed to Islamic truth claims by the modern project. The new centers thus provide scholarly and pedagogic spaces which transcend the parochial differentiations of Muslim communities. They further facilitate the construction of classically resourced Islamic models of leadership which allow these economically and politically disadvantaged communities to operate with a degree of unity, if not unanimity. This challenge which permits a degree of convergence between state and faithful agendas for a more unified Muslim representation and training requires a strong presence of contextually rooted theologians or theologies. Most German Muslims are heirs to the Maturidi theological legacy and the Hanafi legal liturgical tradition, 
which Turkish Republican and also Bosnian thought has often cited as the basis for the creation of a modern Islamic rationalism or empiricism, an appropriation which may prove fruitful in dealing with enlightenment rationalism and utilitarian and natural law conceptions of moral life and the responsibility of individual citizens and religious corporate bodies. One could point to the pioneering 19th century Mektabi Nuwab in Sarajevo, the Sharia school for judges, or as the Austro-Hungarians called it, Shariati Richterschule, as a prototype for resourcing Hanafi Maturidi methods in response to the exigencies of Muslim life under European Christian rule. This positioning of Maturidism as the optimal Muslim space for a dialogue with a modernity which is presumed to be rationalizing and severed from textual revelation invites further research and philological processing of the enormous but still underexplored Maturidi literature. In Tübingen, recently we published the first Maturidi theology reader, which presents Arabic texts with English translations to facilitate access to this tradition. Other initiatives serving Maturidi thought are also planned. But this textual accessing is only a preliminary to the significant challenge of appropriating the heritage to serve as a conversation partner with Kantian and postmodern epistemologies and ethical deontology. The result might in some respect recall the 20th century Neo-Thomas philosophy of Maritain, Copleston and others who used the more philosophical dimensions of the writings of Aquinas as a basis for propounding a foundationalist system intelligible to the increasingly unyielding positivism of academic philosophy. As this ambitious project unfolds, some are evincing the hope that many of the travails with modernity experienced in the mainstream Islamic world, where academic freedom is often seriously curtailed by regime policy, might be overcome. The German experiment would thus provide an institutional infrastructure allowing evolutions of a far more than simply German significance. The purpose, however, cannot be merely abstract and metaphysical. Evidently, morality, including any challenging ethic of encounter with the religious other, must be grounded in sound theology, if it is to be intellectually coherent and acceptable to base communities. However, the metaphysics must be generative of a practical theology. Islam is a religion of orthodoxies, broadly speaking, but also a religion of orthopraxies, with a rich panoply of ethical legal life patterns which shape the existence of believing men and women, taking them from self-orientation to an openness towards transcendence and virtue. Thus, for instance, in our department, we were happy to co-organize an international interfaith conference on green theologies, in which leading Muslim and Christian theologians explored ways in which the resacralizing of humanity's experience of the natural world might offer a strategy for coping with climate change. The proceedings to be published by Moore Zeebeck later this year in a sense showcase the modern Muslim capacity to engage thoughtfully with Christian and secular wisdom in the context of a shared contemporary crisis. Other such areas of collaboration and the creative exploration of difference could also be cited. The German situation of Islamic theology in institutional juxtaposition with other faculties of theology has allowed the transcendence of traditional Orientalist textual work into a new space within the Western Academy, in which Muslims are permitted to work academically within their own intellectual space, rather than submit in a sometimes notably colonial way to paradigms of external origin. This allows practical social impacts of a kind not historically sought by Orientalism whose historic mission to interpret and perhaps control Eastern cultures in an imperial age has shriveled and has not been saliently replaced by a discourse of Muslim identity constructed to facilitate the internal Muslim policy of European nation states. Now, let us look at our second principle, traditional Islamic disciplines in dialogue with social sciences and Oriental studies. I have suggested that a toleration of a space for Muslim insider discourse, paralleling that historically allowed for Christian theology, represents a very significant 
expansion and diversification of the Humboldtian Epstein. Needless to say, it has not gone unchallenged. However, the evident right of non-Christian communities to habitus within the academy, given that since the Westphalian settlement, the public funding of Protestant and Catholic theology has been part of the German constitutional landscape, raises important questions about the curriculum. Evidently, Islamic theology in a modern university setting must adopt a hermeneutic of openness. Every question and perspective must be respectfully considered. A university department cannot be a seminary, presuming a certain creed of compliance, even though accountability to faith communities must be ultimately secured through com community participation in appointment processes. This openness is relatively easy to procure in an Islamic context. Maturidi texts, for instance, insist on the need for rational proof of God and his quantities or qualities. And this tradition of kalam, philosophical theology, grew from Islamic civilization's capacity to accept the challenge of the Aristotelian Platonic symphony, which it inherited from its predecessors. As John Walbridge has shown in his book, The Caliphate of Reason, Islamic thought is intensely hospitable to aql, to ratio. He sees this as one of the distinctive features of the classical madrasa tradition before modernity imposed either fundamentalist or simple pietistic priorities in many Muslim spaces. There is a sense in which a re-engagement with logic, syllogism, and challenges to religion's base assumptions is a reactivation of one of the most successfully formative processes and experiences which led to the medieval Muslim curriculum. This complex return to ratio is nuanced conversation in nuanced conversation with revelation has proved fairly straightforward to champion in our new departments because they are independent. Whereas Catholic faculties, for instance, require licensing in various ways from Rome and the local Episcopal hierarchy, you may remember the difficulties experienced with uh, Hans Küng in Tübingen, Islam has no magisterium, but favors a radically decentered model of religious authority. For some moderns, this is part of its ongoing appeal, and much Western Muslim theology makes full use of it. One could cite the Islamic theologies of German Sherman Jackson, Ingrid Mattson, Tim Winter, and Charles Upton as influential examples. Without sacraments, there need be no priesthood, and therefore no structured authority, despite the quasi ecclesiastical appearance of religious order in some modern Muslim nation states. And this facilitates our task insofar as an Islamic theological faculty in a modern European university is not dependent on licensing and inspection by a hierarchy claiming privileged access to the true interpretation of the deposit of faith and of the purport of scripture. The representative structures of Muslim communities in Europe are essentially political and social in their agendas and claim no right of doctrinal or jurisprudential oversight. The Muslim Council of Britain, for instance, seeks to shape a Muslim contribution to the public conversation, but claims no jurisdiction in internal religious discourses. Still less to offer guidance on the proper symbiosis of secular and sacred knowledge. So here in the United Kingdom, for instance, there are 26 Deobandi seminaries. In contrast with Anglican or Catholic equivalents, these are entirely self-regulating determining their own curriculum and hermeneutic strategies, although they may operate within informal consensual partnerships and exchange staff and insights on the application of classical curricula. In the German context, each of our institutes, while embedded in existing and sometimes quite anciently established university ecosystems, similarly charts its own path through the jungle of contemporary social and philosophical questions. In this way, German Islam can be claimed to echo Islam's recurrent historic patterns of the accommodation of diversity and the indulgence of minority or idiosyncratic views, a habit documented in Thomas Bauer's book, De Kultur de Ambiguitet. Muslims understand the inauguration of a theological world of difference 
and internal conversations unregulated by any magisterium stronger than a vaguely articulated consensus ijma, as one key contribution of Islam to monotheistic history. In some respects, it recalls certain forms of Judaism or the radical Protestantism of the kind which has flourished in Scotland. Scripture alone is authoritative and variant inspirations about its sense are by and large tolerated. Nevertheless, no higher education institute can ignore the force of student interest. German Islam is on the whole attentive to tradition and students in our institutions reflect this. They do not enroll in order to be trained in allegedly objective outside perceptions. Indeed, recent cultural shifts often encourage students to prioritize insider narratives as being possessed of greater intrinsic authenticity, distanced from the allegedly colonial subjection to a hegemonic Western episteme. But despite this student preference, the decision in the new German departments has been in favor of a range of creative and still experimental hybridizations within the regnant German Wissenschaftliche paradigm, including the approaches of religious studies and Orientalism, which in many ways consider German universities as their place of birth. A hybrid approach is moreover inexorable, given that the wider universities impose appointment criteria which require that primary academic training lies within the Occidental paradigm. Where this is Orientalist, as it typically is, and if we are to believe while halak, the term is by no means a simply abusive one, then we are presented with an interesting laboratory experiment in which engaged Muslim academics who have deeply internalized objectivist and Orientalist approaches to texts and traditions interrogate those paradigms from within. The question then becomes, are we Western academics exercising the spirit of Kant and Humboldt in a return to a putative ancestral authenticity? Or are we still Orientals, objects of the academy's gaze, using academic technologies to better proclaim God's glory? Of course, as we all breathe the air of a deconstruction, such a simple binary cannot apply. Each academic and pedagogical decision is considered on the basis of the scholar's personal integration of self, context, knowledge, and perception. There is no single resolution, only a kaleidoscope of applications of the individual self. In practice, these academics, who are typically invited or expected to develop citizenship-friendly interpretations of the complex Muslim inheritance, often find that locating relevant and liberative dimensions within rather than in conflict with the inherited deposit of faith is startlingly easy. So in our six different study programs currently offered at Tübingen Center for Islamic Theology, both at BA and MA levels, the courses range from classical Islamic disciplines, such as systematic theology, philosophy, prophetic tradition, scriptural exegesis, Islamic law, Arabic language, legal theory, and ethics. Yet these cohabit with an equally strong humanities focus including intellectual and social history, Islamic art and aesthetics, interface studies, history of education, and so forth. Finally, practical studies form part of the curriculum for those in the educational and chaplaincy degrees and include pedagogy and spiritual care and empirical research in religion and education. To speak in this effectively pastorally directed pedagogical environment of an Islamic theological commitment to equality and justice, however, is not to claim that every culture defines those concepts identically. By definition, the modern Western elites define them in a manner which reflects a European heritage of the Enlightenment, shaped by Locke, Hayek, Popper, Rawls and others. Evidently, Muslims working in this Western habitat must be entirely fluent in that language and respected for its achievements, particularly in securing the post-war European settlement with its various human rights conventions. However, a contemporary alertness to the parochiality of the European and the imminent risk of coloniality must move Islamic theology beyond an easy subservience 
to these definitions of what constitutes a universal towards a more up-to-date and non-Eurocentric acknowledgement of the right of different narratives to determine their own universals. The claim made by some Muslims skeptical of the new departments of Islamic theology that they exist simply to evolve discourses of assimilation and compliance is best refuted by pointing to the new and inclusive culture of a multi-epistemic university, which regards the narrative linear progress towards modern Western elite definitions of universality as colonial and demeaning. To vindicate the authenticity of the new departments, it is important to point to the opportunities which now exist for the proposing of a non-subaltern discourse of cultural and religious difference. Medieval Europeans determined the value of a narrative in terms of its proximity to Christian orthodoxy. It is essential that modern Europeans do not evaluate scholarly discourse about culture and values on the basis of its compliance with the current value set of European and implicitly Eurocentric elites. In theological language, we point to the Quranic statement that we have appointed a law and a way for each people, and to the principle that every people has been sent a guide. For Maturidism, and not just for Ash'arism, atheistic subjectivism undermines brave universals, insisting that while mind and conscience may recognize ethics, these only become binding in the presence of textual revelation. Theologians point to possible convergences between this theistic subjectivism and a contemporary Western relativizing of values. And here we note that while main journalists and politicians regard the current normativities of Europe as rooted in reason, the major philosophical movements of late modernity have dismissed this entirely. Our values, for many of the most recent thinkers, are simply our values, useful for their familiarity and consensus value, but they are certainly not universals. Here again, we see how Islamic theology can benefit from a nuanced awareness of contemporary intellectual culture. The triumphalism of Victorian discourses of the West and the rest is now impossible. Hence, the collapse of classical Orientalism, accelerated by Edward Said and more recently by Wael Halak. The purpose of Islamic studies cannot be the mapping of an obsolete but often picturesque culture which was necessarily trumped by a, a Spencerian social evolutionary process by the superior adaptive capacity of Western humanity. Still, Laskan scholars resource the scientific racism which defined Islam as Semitic for much of the 20th century. Instead, Orientalism has largely reconfigured itself as more modest projects detached from the older colonial mindset. Today, many Islamic studies specialists, whether Muslim or not, can be identified as advocates, campaigning for migration rights and greater democratization in the Middle East. So this eclipse of the old Orientalist insider, outsider episteme, coupled with a more humble self-understanding by Western elite, abashed by the threat of climate change and other existential threats, is another factor which enlarges the space for Islamic theology in the university. The culture has turned strongly against colonial and supremacist thinking. Hence, the question for Muslim thinkers is not how can Islam be justified to European elites on terms recognized by those elites, but rather how can the diverse Islamic inheritance become the basis for a non-colonial Islamic studies whose episteme and historical cultural aspirations are grounded in a non-Western environment and whose purpose must always be ethical and reparative. Many Muslim scholars consider this to be possible, but practically impossible, since academic research and pedagogy rooted in non-Western and thus non-Humboldtian habits of mind is unlikely to pass, uh, pass muster in the modern university world, in which preferment and peer review mechanisms impose considerable uniformity. Appeals to universals which are not modernity's universals are likely to be penalized in practice, although theoretically acknowledged. For instance, within the project of the St. Andrew's Encyclopedia of Theology, where I serve as a senior editor for the Islam section, it is not uncommon to find some junior Muslim scholars hesitating to contribute to the project, which is interested in reflecting insider perspectives. 
This inhibition is based on the concern that articulating an engaged Muslim take on a given topic may have unfavorable consequences for one's future career. So for the moment, scholars in the new institutions tend to operate conventionally, publishing in mainstream journals and attending mainstream conferences. But it is the experience of most that the disciplinary rigor expected on Orientalist work, particularly in the editing of manuscripts and the historical contextualization of uh, Islamic beliefs, imposes high and beneficial standards. Many do not wish to switch epistemes, but find the best of Western styles of work to be very congenial. Now, a few words on the third principle, the interfaith context of our initiative. Islamic theology in Europe possesses the advantage of a shared Semitic and Middle Eastern origin with Christianity, a heritage historically interpreted through the categories of Aristotelian and Platonic thought. To this impo importantly shared rooting must be added the center's centuries-old uh, substantive interactivity. Aquinas's indebtedness to Ibn Rushd or Averroes for instance, or the early Kalam resourcing of the Christian philosophy of John Philoponus. Orientalist historians have documented this interplay in detail, but it is for contemporary theologians, alert to the risks of dichotomizing and othering, to find exemplary, though not binding precedent in pre-modern Christian and Muslim interaction. At Tübingen, our Center for Islamic Theology seriously engages with our context in Germany and in the wider European environment. It maintains close ties with the faculties of Catholic and Protestant theology. In particular, I would like to mention the name of the Lutheran theologian, our dear colleague Christoph Schwöbel, now sadly deceased, who, even after his migration from Tübingen to St. Andrews, consistently supported our fledgling institution not only out of sense of neighborliness and collegiality, but from the conviction that the Abrahamic theologies, historically divided by difficult histories, must explore new strategies of mutual fecundation if they are to locate shared strategies of response to the growth of chauvinism in Europe. It is with this spirit that since the early days of Islamic theology, we have been closely cooperating with the Catholic and Protestant uh, theology faculties in both teaching and research. This enables a cross-fertilization not only between our respective traditions of commentary on the diverse Abrahamic heritage, but also between our rather different trajectories and experiences of negotiating a settlement with modernity. In Germany, that settlement appeared fairly early. In Kant's fierce opposition to any confessional project within universities and the subsequent creation of theological faculties as opposed to seminaries, the debate, which is even a constitutional one in the Federal Republic, is still far from settled and is becoming a more contested space in an increasingly secular German environment. Engaging with the ways in which that intense local binary has been understood and resolved has been an important and enriching element as we seek to create an academically responsible Glaubenslehre for Islam in the heart of its university system. One of the early fruits of this interaction with the older theological faculties has been the recently established joint master's degree in interfaith studies, which also includes Jewish studies. Thus, our students are in a position to explore all three Abrahamic faith traditions within this unique program. The trilogue is enhanced, but not inhibited or co-opted by the real or imagined ground rules of secular religious studies. Here we join the mainstream national and Western debate about the viability of faith hospitable spaces in the public square, uh, in the public square and in national institutions. There is certainly a specifically Islamic strand within that debate, but we see ourselves as an augmentation to the already complex range of settlements with the secular academy. A fluid and ongoing dialogue which responsibly conducted can only intensify the academic standards of both sides. What contemporary academic practices might prove congenial for this bridge building? dialogical and socially reparative style of theology which our faculties seem invited to promote? 
We have suggested that the older triumphalist narratives, which place Europe at the summit of an evolutionary process, are not generally regarded as defensible and may be experienced as repugnantly colonial. Young people are unlikely to apply to institutions where they are told that their culture is inferior and that salvation lies in converting to the social beliefs of dominant elites. But they need to be clear that they are not being offered a seminary or madrasa curriculum either, or anything like it. The agenda must therefore seek contemporary academic practices which do not disable Muslim faith commitments or social visions, but which nonetheless expect a high degree of attentiveness to difference. One such method which we at Tübingen have found particularly helpful has been that of scriptural reasoning, familiarly abbreviated as to SR. This is a strategy of rereading scriptural foundational texts with an eye to detecting contemporary applications. But whereas modernist readings typically attempt to massage the texts to make them comply with current values, scriptural reasoning relativizes and parochializes modernity, while accepting a kind of pragmatism in the selection of preferred exegetic outcomes. The intellectual ancestry of this is American, through John Dewey and Pierce, but the use of a pragmatism in ex exegesis began in the early 1990s with the creation of the Society for Textual Reasoning, a university-based forum for scholars of modern Jewish philosophy and scholars of rabbinic texts to meet and study together. Led by Peter Oakes, Stephen Kapnus, and others, this found in a reading which sought reparative outcomes, a convergence with Talmudic styles of reading which refuse decisiveness, but celebrated ambivalence and polyvalence. These hermeneutes were soon joined by Christian theologians, such as David Ford and Daniel Hardy, leading to the creation of the Society of Scriptural Reasoning. Finally, Muslim theologians joined, their research often being platformed in the Movement's House Journal, the Journal of Scriptural Reasoning, located at the University of Virginia. The appeal of this method is clear. For many of us in Islamic studies, it offers a refreshing potential to broaden the field, so often inhibited by its philological and historiographic templates, by the inclusion of a significant awareness of wider philosophical and cultural realities in the academy. <coughs> Oriental studies has, as its name perhaps implied, often formed a silo or backwater whose unresponsiveness to new methods and philosophies has been deeply frustrating to many who seek to study Islam or other putatively oriental cultures with a fresh openness to the larger cultural and ideational shifts in the university. The field has often been criticized for its archaism and its lack of consciousness of more contemporary methods and outlooks. And Muslims in the field are often no less guilty of a kind of Victorianism in the way they understand and internalize the rules for progression in the guild. Some also feel the need for deference to the fixed opposition of many to what is seen as the intrusion of a normative religious commitment. In contrast to this old school Orientalist stasis, the expanding universe of scriptural reasoning allows scholars to apply contemporary and even postmodern approaches without being restricted by the need to cite contemporary authorities in any programmatic or compliance signaling way. Participants bring to the table their own confessional libraries, which may entail philological, historical critical, theological, or other preoccupations. No determinate outcome is expected or even hoped for. In this sense, scriptural reasoning is a postmodern exercise and is thus very congenial to the dominant mode of philosophical work in the university. However, and for many Muslims, this is the critical point, it is hospitable to the foundationalist perspectives also, provided always that these do not impose themselves as the architects of a unique favored reading. As with Jewish hermeneutics, although perhaps to a lesser extent, Islamic styles of scriptural reading unaccountable to a centralized institution have historically been almost indefinitely diverse. The major pre-modern Quranic commentaries invariably cite a range of possible meanings of each verse. The author may indicate a preference, but this is seldom proposed as decisive. 
My personal experience with scriptural reasoning goes back to 2004 when I began my postgraduate studies in Cambridge as I was initiated into SR by an exceptional circle of Jewish, Christian and Muslim scholars such as Peter Oakes, David Ford and Tim Winter. In Tübingen, then teamed up with my late colleague Christoph Schwebel, I taught seven courses of scriptural reasoning seminars between 2015 and 21, covering a range of topics from theological anthropology to ecology, from salvation to monotheism, from time, God and eternity to eschatology. Last year, our scriptural reasoning seminar dedicated to the memory of Christoph focused on the theme of hope, this time co-taught by a number of distinguished Jewish, Christian and Muslim scholars. The same pattern was followed this summer, hosting guest speakers, among them Peter Oakes and David Ford, two founding fathers of SR. These seminars have been a fruitful platform for genuine religious and theological con conversations for our students of Islamic and Christian theologies and beyond. To those schooled in the older rule book of Islamic studies, this seems to introduce philosophical conventions and interests which violate the laws of the guild. To this, the response of a Muslim and other hermeneutics is the simple observation that classical Orientalism with its canons of belonging and its stern procedures for what we might nowadays call the cancellation of violators seems less in tune with the mood of the modern academy than this modality of doing work with Muslim scriptures and texts. Readers of scriptural reasoning monographs and journals may even find themselves as insider theologians to be better placed near the heart of the university than the classical Orientalists themselves. The turn to the subject, as many call it, upsets and destabilizes traditional natural theologies, but no less thoroughly demolishes the Kantian reductionism which has maintained the firewall between religious studies and theology. So, if I may say a few words of conclusion, here I have tried to summarize the first 10 years of the infancy of Islamic theology in European academe with a special focus on the German university scene. For all the epistemological and institutional challenges, and sometimes one may even say prejudices, the foundations of this field have been established with the first fruits ripening in both teaching and research, as testified by a growing number of popular study programs, rigorous research projects, and respectable publications. Following on these three foundational principles, namely a healthy balance between theory and practice, a dialogue between traditional Islamic disciplines and social sciences, as well as Oriental studies, and a genuine engagement with an interfaith context, often sidelined by academic convention, one may regard the future of Islamic theology in Germany with a certain optimism. Of scriptural reasoning in its trilogic modality, shaped by a further dialogue with secular modernity, David Ford speaks of the double simultaneous intensity of both reasoning around scriptures and reasoning across the scriptural secular boundary. To do one without the other limits the resources of possible wisdom. To do both together in mutual enhancement and critique could well shape vital contributions to the Islam West encounter." End of quote. It is this double, simultaneous intensity which should guide our work. Older traditions of editing and translating and of historical analysis, even reduction, are not threatened by this new space of what Ford calls interactive particularity, which fully encounters modern secular wisdom. Instead, they are complemented and even affirmed. Here, Orientalism finds its contemporary vocation and resignification the supply of the edited and comprehended discursive tradition of Islam, which more contemporary methods than engage, not to close, but to open up the episteme. The Quran insists that the differences of your languages and colors are a blessed divine indicant, and the growing Muslim demographies of Europe, heirs to lens and traditions of immense diversity, seem well-placed when well-led to assist Europe in its present historic transformation into a multi-ethnic and multi-confessional continent. Whatever future evolutions we may expect, European Islamic theology thus becomes a discipline of far more than purely academic significance. <laughs>